Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so um, this talk's called Ruby Home and it's about automating your home with Ruby. Um, my name's Carl Entwistle. I'm on Twitter at Carl Entwistle. Um, before I start the talk, um, could everyone raise their hand if they have a smartphone? Kind of expecting everyone's hand. And uh, keep your hand raised if you have an iPhone. And keep your hand raised if you have a IoT device, like smart light bulbs or a thermostat. Cool, so, sorry? Um, yeah, for the talk, purposes of the talk, yeah. Okay, cool. So the talk's for one person in the room, which is brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> Not even mine, my dad. Oh, okay, cool. Um, so I thought I'd start with the why. Um, I've been an Apple enthusiast since 2007, and um, I got a Mac Mini after they made the switch to Intel. And this is a picture of me when I was 18, queuing up for an iPhone 3G. I queued up from um, four in the morning and I was second in line. I got teased by some builders going on their way to work, but it was cool to have the phone on release day. Um, the second thing is I recently moved to Bristol uh, about three years ago and bought a house with my wife and um, it looks exactly like the one in the picture. <laughs> um, so after uh, we moved into our house, I decided that I wanted it to be like a smart home with all um, smart devices and stuff. Um, so I bought some, the first thing that I bought was some light bulbs. Um, so I've got like Philips Hue light bulbs in all the rooms in the house and I've got the bridge and um, the switches and, um, and they need an app. So me and my wife both installed the Philips Hue app onto our phone. So after I had the light bulb sorted, um, I thought I need a smart thermostat. So I bought a Nest thermostat and um, that also needed an app, um, so that's installed on both our phones as well. And after that, I bought a soundbar, and hopefully at this point you get the idea, all of the uh, smart home devices that I needed, that well, I didn't need to buy, but I wanted to buy, <laughs> um, have their own uh, apps. So I ended up with quite a few on my phone. I've got Nest, Loop, Hue, Eve, Amazon Alexa, uh, one for the speaker, the Apple TV, the Fire TV, and, um, it's a bit of a first world problem, but I kind of thought it's kind of annoying having all these different apps on my phone. And what I really want is just one um, application to kind of control all the different devices in my house. Um, uh, so Apple um, offer a software framework called HomeKit on um, iOS devices. And HomeKit is a software framework for making smart home devices work seamlessly with iOS devices. And uh, by iOS devices, they mean basically everything in their ecosystem, which is Apple TV, iPhone, Apple Watch, HomePod, iPad, and with the latest software update, also the Macintosh. Um, so HomeKit works with all of these different IoT devices. There's uh, lights, PowerPoints, windows, air conditioners, speakers, cameras, garage doors, like all of the ones on, on the slide. Um, the other thing I like about it is that it works with Siri, so you can say things like turn on the living room lights, dim the living room lights, set the temperature, set the dinner scene, or my personal favourite one, what temperature is the shed? The shed temperature in your Kroger home is at 14 degrees Celsius. It's good to know. <laughs> Um, and it's not just Siri, there's also the visual app on the phone. So here I'm like quickly swiping through um, the app that I've got set up with the different IoT devices in the different rooms in my house. It goes quite quickly, but um, we'll, I'll go, go into more detail on that later. Um, so that's great, but there's a bit of a problem. Um, you can only use IoT devices with HomeKit that bear the label works with HomeKit. Um, and in my context, that means the Philips Hue light bulbs kind of worked out the box, so they get a green tick mark. But the, the Nest thermostat and uh, the soundbar, they don't work. So I could either rebuy those things from a different manufacturer or like wait for a software update that I might not get. 
So at this point, I kind of had an idea. It would be great if HomeKit could work with Ruby. Um, and the reason for that is that I could get HomeKit to speak to Ruby, then I could get Ruby to speak to the Nest API, which could then speak to my thermostat or my camera or smoke detector and vice versa. Like if someone physically changes the temperature on the thermostat, it would communicate to the Nest API, which could speak to Ruby and then um, push that information back to my phone. So at that point, I'd be able to have the Philips Hue light bulbs and then I could kind of bridge the gap between the Nest devices and the soundbar. So the next logical step was to uh, do a Google search and a GitHub search. And I was like genuinely surprised when I couldn't find a Ruby library for doing this. Um, there's one for JavaScript, which is really great, called Homebridge. And there's also quite a good one for Google Go. So I could have just used those. Um, but I remembered this quote from an inspirational man, uh, which says, you must be the change you wish to see in the world. So I decided to write my own uh, Ruby library. And um, the library is called Ruby Home. And uh, you can install it with gem install Ruby Home. I think it, yeah. <laughs> uh, so I'm expecting this guy to do that when he gets home. <laughs> Um, it's also on GitHub under Carl Entwistle Ruby Home. And um, the numbers speak for themselves, guys. It's a very, very popular <laughs> library. Five people are watching it, 20 people have starred it, and three people have forked it. Um, <laughs> you one of those, did you start it? I, I did star it myself, and I'm also watching it myself. <laughs> so it's actually four people of, yeah, anyway. Um, I'm trying to get the numbers up a bit. Um, so I thought I'd go on to the, the how of how I did this. Um, so on Apple's website, uh, in the developer section, they offer some documentation for the HomeKit accessory protocol specification prior to the date on the slide, which 19th of November 2017. It was actually like a closed thing. I think you could only get access to it if you sort of gave them a pile of money or something but it's now like an open standard, so anyone um, can use it. So I downloaded this document, and I was really delighted to find out that it was a 256-page uh, technical document that directly references 12 RFCs. And if you've ever read an RFC, you'll know that those RFCs reference a whole bunch of other RFCs. So I thought I could either like sit there and read that document and try and understand it, or just break it down into like logical steps and divide and conquer. So what I did was, on the home app, uh, just went through the normal flow of how you would add a device and uh, got to this screen. If you get a device from a manufacturer, like an official manufacturer, then normally it would show up on this screen. So the first challenge was just to get something to show up on this screen. So I read a little bit of the documentation and realized that um, it uses multicast DNS, or Apple calls this bonjour. You're all familiar with this because anytime you've been on a network, the shared devices are broadcasting um, their services using multicast DNS. And also on an iPhone, if you use AirDrop, um, that's kind of what makes it work. So that's why you can see the different computers that are available. Um, for the Macintosh, there's a really good bit of software by a company called Tildesoft called Bonjour Browser. And if you run that on a network, you can see all the different devices and the multicast DNS that they're broadcasting. Like, I ran it in my house, and I didn't actually know that my soundbar had like a website and an API. That's the one that I've expanded. Um, since finding out about this, I quite enjoy running it at airports or hotels or like friends' houses just to kind of see what's available on the network. It's kind of interesting sometimes what is just there and like not secure. So uh, going back to the problem, because I already had a Philips Hue device, um, I just had a look at what the Philips Hue bridge was broadcasting. So I just knew that I needed to broadcast something similar. And I found a Ruby library for doing this, which um, is written by Tenderlove, and it's called multi uh, sorry, it's called DNS SD. Um, so I downloaded that, and it's got a really simple syntax here. So you just require DNS SD, and then here I'm assigning a TCP server to the variable HTTP, and then the DNS SD DSL lets you just say D 
dnssd.announce with the service and the name, and then I'm like confirming that that's working with Bonjour Browser. Um, so it's a bit more uh, code, but I basically just made it broadcast similar stuff to what the Philips Hue Bridge is doing. And at this point, yay, I got it to actually display on my iPhone. So the next logical step was to click on that. And um, it asked me for a setup code. I just put in like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it sent a post request to the TCP server that I was running. Uh, the path was pair setup. That's pretty normal. Had a content type that I wasn't familiar, application pairing plus TLV8. And then uh, also the body, instead of being JSON or XML, was just some hexadecimal uh, data, which was also pretty unexpected. Um, for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to say that the pairing process for the device is like a long and complicated process. Um, it kind of consumed about four months of my life, like trying to figure it out. But I got there in the end, and after this pairing process, um, from that shared secret, which is the pin code where I said I did one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, um, each of the accessories like derive a unique token. I just represented it with different keys. And uh, my library, Ruby Home, also holds a corresponding token for each device. And those tokens exist for as long as the life cycle of the request. So um, as soon as a device comes online and goes through the pairing, um, it actually keeps the, a socket connection open. And like they, it keeps its tokens. And then as soon as you like walk out the house or leave the network, it closes and goes away. Um, so at the point where all the devices have their own unique keys, um, I was really pleased to find that Apple, in their infinite wisdom, had decided to make a custom HTTP protocol. And um, the specification just says that each HTTP message is split into frames no larger than 1,024 bytes. Um, and like some other technical stuff. And there's just a caveat at the bottom that once the session security has been established, if there's any decryption issues, like you have to close the connection immediately. When I looked at something like that from the document, I thought, um, that sounds really complicated. Like, what does that even mean? It actually turned out to be relatively simple. Um, this is like a standard HTTP response. Don't worry about the body. <laughs> it's just got the status code, so it's HTTP <coughs> 1.1. Sorry, the protocol is HTTP 1.1. The status code is 200 OK. You can see the headers, content type, content length, server, date, and it's requesting for the connection to be kept alive. I've just got a really big body there so that it's greater than 1,024 bytes. Uh, like taking that standard HTTP response, the uh, specification wants you to break it up. So all I'm doing is breaking it up into um, three frames, as Apple calls them. And the first one's 1,024 bytes, and the second one, and then the last one is just the remainder. If you just remember that they're color coded with red, green, and purple. Um, so you just take each one of those frames, then you encrypt them, um, like, as a frame. Um, and also at this point, you add in a bit of additional metadata, um, which is called a nonce. And, um, it's just like zero for the first one, one for the second one, and two for the third one. Then at this point, you just add the output of those three things together. And at this point, you've got the HAP, like the specifications HTTP response, which is just a really long um, like hexadecimal string. Um, the reason that I mentioned the nonce uh, is because it means that there can't be any response replaying. So if anyone's on your network and like packet sniffing what the devices are sending back and forwards, um, because the number gets incremented each time, it means for the next request it expects it to start at three and then four. So um, the phone and Ruby Home both know what the count should be. So if you replayed a request, it instantly knows, I've already seen that, so I know that it's um, a response replay. Um, if you're still with me, then you might be wondering uh, if I did this with a rack middleware um, for the encryption layer stuff. 
If you're um, familiar with Rack, then you'll know that um, to use Rack, you have to provide an app, an object that responds to the call method. Um, it takes an environment hash as the parameter and returns an array with three elements, which is the status code, um, a hash of the headers, and the response body. So that's the, uh, the Rack um, DSL for um, sending this HTTP response. And I've just labeled the response code, the headers, and the body there. Um, if you remember, I need to encrypt the whole thing. I can't encrypt it. I can't encrypt it as the status code or the header or the body. I need to do everything at once. Um, so I kind of came to the conclusion that it can't be a middleware, and it's actually a bit, I think it's a bit of a limitation of the middleware um, DSL. So after I realized this, um, I had a stiff drink and a bit of a think. And um, if any of you are testing your Rails apps, then you're probably using Rack Test to communicate with your Rails app. Um, and that basically communicates with the Rails app, but it doesn't need to actually spawn um, a TCP server. So I kind of use that as my inspiration to just come up with this architecture which is where the devices communicate with a custom TCP proxy server, and then that just delegates upstream to a Sinatra app. The last uh, thing that I thought was interesting from the technical specification is it talks about unsolicited HTTP. Um, it just says that the accessory has to deliver notifications by sending an event message. Um, I've like, shown this on the diagram here. Um, so after devices go through the pairing process if one of them says to like open a door where I've put the line that's beneath that line is where things become unsolicited so they weren't requested by the device um, so I'm like sending the iPhone and the iPad a signal to say that the door has been opened and uh, the other example of like an unsolicited request would be if a phone had gone through the pairing process and someone physically turned the nest that would um, send a signal to the Nest API, and then I could intercept that, and I'd need to send it to the phone. Um, that was quite a lot of technical stuff, so now I'm hoping it will be a bit lighter with um, a, a three demos. Um, so the first demo that I want to show you um, is called Fan, and uh, it's, oh, you can't see anything. Um, sorry about that, okay. Um, okay, let me just bring this over. Whoops. So I'll just show you. So this is the. I kind of had to come up with a DSL for using this. Um, each accessory um, has some characteristics assigned to it. The first one is some accessory information. And the second one is the fan itself. The fan has one characteristic, which is power. Um, so it's just on or off. And um, you can subscribe to different events. Actually, the only event you can subscribe to at the moment is updated. And then that would just yield a block, which is the characteristic itself. And then you can intercept its value, so you know if it was switched on or off. So if I run that code, and uh, go through the pairing process on, my, on this iPhone. Just got to see what that code is. It's different each time. Eight, nine, two. Hopefully, yeah, it worked. Um, so now, uh, if I just clear my terminal, then if I switch the fan on, you can see in the terminal it says the fan was switched on, and if I switch the fan off, then it says the fan was switched off. It's actually quite, well, it's fun for me um, to, um, like all the different accessories that I showed you on the previous slide, I kind of just enjoyed like seeing what they all look like, the way that Apple's implemented them on this interface. Um, the second demo that I wanted to show you um, is a garage door, whoops. I hope that that wasn't an important file. Uh, so I'll just quickly go through the pairing again. Hopefully it'll work for a second time. 
Uh, right. I should really hard code the um, pairing code for the talk. And OK, cool, it paired again. That's great. So now I should have a garage door. Awesome. And, but oh, it looks like the door is open. So I'm just going to close the door. And if I just, oh, uh, I kind of messed that up. Uh, you can see that on the phone, the spinner is still spinning. Um, if I hadn't have accidentally paused the video, then, oh, OK. So if I hadn't have accidentally paused it, that event would have happened when it closed. And uh, I can also reopen it again. And this is an example of the unsolicited request that I was speaking about. When the door finishes opening, it's sending the unsolicited uh, request to the phone so that it knows that the door is now open. And that, that would also get sent to any other devices that were paired. Um, the last demo I have, I didn't really want to lug my soundbar all the way here. Um, but I have, oh, oh, here it is, sorry. I have a video of um, my soundbar working with um, Ruby Home. So I've like switched it off, switch it back on again. It's very exciting. <laughs> and uh, whoops. Uh, oh yeah, that is uh, the end of my talk. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Lewis. What was the <laughs> hardest part of this uh, project? The hardest part? Uh, probably just like sticking with it. And um, I didn't mention, but any time that you mess up the response to the device, like if there's one th uh, character missing, that phone will just instantly close the connection because it doesn't decrypt properly. So I've probably gone through the pairing process at home like a lot of times. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know, a lot of times. Uh, so just kind of um, not giving up and just keep on doing it. <laughs> it was a bit tricky, but I kind of got there in the end. Uh, so, yeah, it was worth it. I guess I have a question, which is the opposite of that. What's the most exciting device that you paired up with? Uh, the most exciting device, apart from the soundbar, uh, I don't know. I kind of liked the. I, I actually quite like playing around with the light bulbs because they give you like a, a hue picker. So you can kind of change the color and then it'll send back to, the, um, to Ruby Home like the hexadecimal value. I wanted to make like some crazy thing where I could control a game or something with it, but um, kind of ran out of time. So that's why I had the uh, soundbar. Well, the strangest device, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's really lame in my case. It's just that I was, gen I, like, was genuinely surprised when my soundbar, like I was thinking I'm going to have to do something with the Raspberry Pi where it sends an IR code um, to turn it on and off. And then when I ran that program, I was like, oh, what? My soundbar actually just already has um, an API. I don't have any w weirder devices in my house. <laughs> oh, on a public one. Um, like, I found someone who had a NAS that was just completely wide open. So you could just go on there and like browse everything. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that was a bit concerning. <laughs> cool. Thanks very much.